uh, Rick uh, Hawkinsmith have remodeled that side of the uh, museum. We have a tank here you saw on the news about a month ago, and it's a Sherman tank, uh, a great asset for our museum. And very briefly on tanks, because we're going to talk about uh, bombers today, but tanks in general created in the early part of the 20th century for the First World War. Uh, Leonardo da Vinci wrote a sketch of it back during the uh, 15, 1600s, whenever he was living, but it never came into effect because uh, it had to be uh, moved by a person, and to have a heavy armor, they would be strong enough to move from inside peddling. So, because of the Industrial Revolution, 1772, steam, and then the combustible engine later, that's what allowed this to happen. And I'm surprised it didn't happen before the First World War. But the First World War was pretty important thing to happen. So this Sherman tank was built for the Second World War. It made 84,000 in the United States, uh, four times more than the Germans, four times more than the British. It's an amazing machine. And whenever you make something, people try to improve it. And so the Germans did make some bigger, better machines called the Tiger II, and it was double the size of that. Uh, so when you think of a tank, there's three things that a tank needs. It needs to be able to have firepower, and that has a 75 millimeter gun. So they came up with a 110 millimeter gun, so it would blow this one out of the water. The problem when you get a bigger tank, a bigger gun, you've got to have a bigger, uh, some more uh, steel on it to protect it, but also bigger engines, so the weight is a problem. So a lot of those German tanks, the Tiger IIs, were lost. Uh, because the Germans put them up themselves because they would get ahead of all their support facilities. If you, to, this tank weighs 67,000 pounds, it's not easy to move it around. And some tanks are double the size of World War II. So you just think of a logistical nightmare when these things get stuck and when the engine doesn't work and when maintenance isn't good. Those are problems with these tanks. So Evansville rebuilt and refurbished uh, 1,600 tanks. So probably, that's close to about 2% of all the tanks made, but probably out of the ones that need refurbishment, probably about 5 to 10% of the tanks. So Evansville was a big deal here over by the old North High School. They had a place that they uh, worked on and uh, drove them around. But that was a fabulous thing for Evansville to do between 43 and 45. Now, a couple things coming up. That's just uh, introduction things. I'd like you to send your family and friends. We have simulators here. One FAA approved upstairs and uh, love to have uh, kids and your relatives practicing on it. Uh, this is uh, B-25 day, and there's a big handout up here, a big uh, sign, B-25 day is the 16th and 17th of July, and you can get on a B-25, tour it, or you can even fly it. You've got to pay to fly on it, but you can tour it, and I think you'll enjoy that, bring family and friends. It's a whole weekend, and that's our B-25 day. Love to have you out here bring kids, bring anybody. It'll be a busy day for us. It's a Saturday and Sunday about two weeks from now. So the preface to that, we're going to have a talk on the B-25, and this has a B-25 picture here. If you know Harold Boots, uh, Harold Boots uh, flew, I think, uh, multiple missions in that, and many people from Evansville uh, flew missions to B-25. It was a remarkable plane, and uh, Mike Rosh, he's a pilot, uh, Food for a lot of people in town here, and uh, he's an uh, excellent talker. He's going to talk about the B-25. So, no further ado, uh, uh, Mike Rush. All right, I'm going to get my display back where it's supposed to start, so I don't lose my place. Everybody comes up here and moves my slide. As you can see, there's a few of them, but we'll keep it moving. And what we're going to do today is go through the various marks for design and development of the B-25. <clears throat> In 1936, with the Germans and all their medium bombers, Great Britain and France were a little nervous about that. So they were over here looking for a medium bomber that they could buy. Well, North America came up with the NA-21 Dragon. 
which was their idea of a new <coughs> state of the art. Uh, turns out the British and the French didn't buy it. It was slightly underpowered, but they wanted an airplane that could carry 10,000 pounds of bombs at, or long distance, or 2,200 pounds short distance. Well, they were a little underpowered with the R-1630 engines, <coughs> and they didn't buy it. Now, if you look at it, it's got a little bit of an ugly doubling look. It's the first multi-engine project that North America did. But if you give them a little slack, this is 1936, four years later, they built this. That's a P-51 Mustang. Probably the most successful airplane in World War II. So, they caught on pretty quick. And 1964, they built this which is a Mach 3, the Valkyrie is a Mach 3 Intercontinental Bomber. It did not go into production because surface air missiles were too improved. And this thing had too big a radar cross-section. It was like a headlight in the sky and they figured they'd shoot it down. But I made two articles of it and it was used for high-speed, high-altitude research, which of course later on went to the SR-71, that other high-performance aircraft. Now, in 1938, the U.S. Army Air Force got interested for the same reasons in having medium bombers. They approached North America and they came up with their design NA-40. And it still used the 1830 engines. It was a little underpowered and it was a little unstable. So they went back to the drawing board, North America, and they came out with the NA-40B, which is where they went to the R-2600 engines, which is the engines they settled on to get a little more horsepower, speed, payload, etc. They crashed the NA-40 because it had stability problems. But as the war was coming up, this is still in 1939, they did away with the prototype system where a company builds a prototype, they improve on it, build another one, they improve on it eventually, they get a conforming type that goes into production. The Navy and the Army said, well, we don't have time for that. So they started building them. Now this NA-62 was the prototype. It was a B-25, year number one. Now if you look at it, the wings are straight all the way from the fuselage out to the tip. And that's the dihedral. It's supposed to add to the stability. Well, it did a little too much. The airplane was a little quirky, slightly unstable. <clears throat> and so they kept building it. They made nine of them like this. Then they finally decided that they needed to change the wing. What they did was they cranked it. The wing from the fuselage out to the engines. Okay, I bet. It's from the fuselage out to the engines, the wing tilts up. The engines out of the wing tips, it tilts down. And those two settings kind of counteract with each other, making a more stable airplane. <clears throat> now they did a, this was the B-25 for the first 40. Then they went to the B-25A. Now this is the first one that they considered combat ready. It had crew armament, self-sealing tanks, and it had to crank away for better, greater stability. You can handle this thing a little better. The next model, come off the assembly line or off the drawing boards basically, was the B-25B. This is the one that Doolittle took to Tokyo. They chose this one because it could take off in a shorter distance than other aircraft they looked at. They needed an airplane that could get it airborne fully loaded in less than 500 feet because that's how much deck space they had when they loaded all the B-25s on the carrier to go to Tokyo. Now this also initiated the ventral, let me back that one, it introduced an unsuccessful ventral turret. <coughs> okay, I got to close the microphone now. The ventral turret didn't have room for somebody to stand in their head on the belly of these things. The ball turret hadn't been invented yet. So, ventral turret gunner, he's down here at the bottom of the illustration. Okay. 
Austin Laser Pointer. The guy on the bottom illustration, he's the gunner for the medical turret. He's a knee pads and a bicycle seat, and he looks vertically down into a periscope that is in the turret. So he's looking down into the periscope, the periscope, and he turns the turret so it looks in different directions. His position doesn't move. You talk about a vertigo, vomit-inducing situation, and that was why it was not very successful. You gotta can't shoot while he's throwing up. So we held on to it for a while. Now this is the internal of a B25B, and it's typical of all of them. If you are thinking of going through the B25J, which is the one that's coming here, the interior is gonna be very comparable. You need to be young and spry or flexible. Because they were built for 20-somethings to crawl around in the parachute zone. And get into one of these, it's gonna be tight. However, you, know, you pay your money, you take your chance. If this is the layout of your standard B25. They have bombardier navigator, gunners, and the co-pilot and pilot. Now the Tokyo mission, they had to take out the Norton bomb sites. The Norton bomb site is designed to shoot at high altitude, to drop bomb at high altitude. They were going to be at 1,500 feet over the targets of Tokyo. They were going to go to Tokyo at about 50 feet off the water. They did not want to be seen. But Norton has to have time and an initial point tracking and all that because you're bombing 20, 30,000 feet. Well, they came up with what they called a Mark Twain bomb site. If you remember from Mark Twain, his name comes from the depth of six feet. I'm sorry, two fathoms, 12 feet. This is kind of the same approximation as you can see. It's got angles on it, and I'm not sure what angle they use. It probably depends on wind direction or whatever. But the bombardier sighted down that cross member when the, whatever he wanted to hit was lined up in the sights, he dropped the bombs. And I don't know how much it cost, but it made probably about 35 cents. But it worked. They had a very high percentage of hits on target in Tokyo because they were only 1,500 feet above them. So this was how they traveled. They stacked them on the deck of the Hornet, which is pretty gutsy for the ship because while they got a deck full of B-25s, they're helpless. Now they had their fighters aboard there in the hangar deck, but the Enterprise went along as an escort because with B-25s strapped to the deck, it's a huge sitting duck. When they got time to launch them, they moved them back each airplane, now it's been said that Doolittle had the shortest run, that's really not correct. They needed 500 feet. And Doolittle, his airplane on this picture, is in position to launch. Now, if you look on the deck, you see a white line under the left engine and a thinner white line under the nose wheel. He had to stay on those lines because if you look at the right of the picture, the wing tip of the airplane is hanging out over the edge of the deck. You can't see it in the picture but the island superstructure of the ship is about six feet to the right of that wing tip. But he can't wiggle too much or he's going to hit the ship. And when he would launch, the next aircraft would be taxied into position and he would launch. Now this is Doolittle. If you want to look at both pictures, this airplane would lift off at about 65 miles an hour. So it wouldn't have to run very far. The ship's doing about 30 to 35. It wouldn't take very long to get up to 65. And he's just about to lift off in the first picture. Of course, he's airborne in the second one. Now, you'll notice he's climbing at a pretty good angle. He doesn't have anything to get over. I mean, he's on the tallest part of the ship, or the tallest thing on the ship at the moment. What he's doing is he's making room on a multi-engine airplane. If you're below what they call VMC, Velocity Minimum Control, which on this airplane is 145 miles an hour. If you're below that speed and you lose power on an engine, 
you do not have enough control authority to keep the airplane going straight. It rolls toward the dead engine. In this picture, he's probably about 90 feet above the water. The deck is around 60 feet. He's climbing so that if he loses an engine, or actually if an engine just hiccups, he loses a little power, the thing's going to roll. Because he's still climbing at about something less than 145. What he's going to do if he loses an engine, he's going to turn left or right and try to shut down the engine that's still running and go splash right side up. That's bad enough. If he splashes straight ahead, whether he's right side up or not, the ship's going to run over him. So the gussy part here is as that airplane is running on the deck of that ship, it's not fast enough to be controlled. If anybody of the 16 had had an engine issue, it would have been a fireball or an oily splash in the ocean because you cannot recover. <clears throat> Add to that, this was the overhaul plan. See on the picture, the carrier is about 600 miles. 650, I think, was when they were spotted. They lost them 250 miles early over Tokyo and then down to China, which is out around the 1500 mile mark, which is why a lot of them ran out of fuel. They had to launch them early. Now, according to their computations, they had about 2,500 miles worth of fuel until starvation. Some did, some did. <coughs> Many of them bailed out before the airplane ran out of fuel. But you're betting against the odds all the way. There will probably be, I don't know if we have a speaker scheduled, to go more into detail of the Doolittle rate. I think we do. But in any case, I'm just going to mention that because that was the use of the B-25B, the first two, they only made 120 of them. So they got used up through the war. Then they went to the B-25C or D. They were made almost identical to each other. The B-25C was made in Inglewood, in California. The B-25B was made in Kansas City, Kansas, Fairfax Airport. They differentiate between them because there can be a little difference in sub-assemblies, generators, pumps, motors, things like that. But otherwise, they were identical. And this is the standard armament. You've got the upper turret back on the, on the dorsal, and then this one still had the ventral turret. Most units didn't use it or they took it off. The Doolittle Raiders took it out. That's 700 pounds came off the airplane, and that's 100 pounds, I'm sorry, 100 gallons of fuel. But if they needed fuel, when you're 50 feet over the water, you're not going to have anybody under you, so don't worry about it. So they got rid of it. They kept the C's and D's. This is an example that's flying today, and it was in 2010, I think it's still out there, of a B-25B. Make out the, the uh, website. They fly the same like the one from Champagne. They fly it around. And the only reason they're flying is somebody puts the time, effort, money, etc. and you're doing it. <coughs> so when you got to get done here, go to the websites and you can search by aircraft name, whatever. Find out where these aircraft are and go support them. Because that's like the Champagne girl. That's how they pay the bill. People come and give the money to see that airplane. Now this one was at the Wright-Patterson Museum in 2010. They had 17 B-25s in there. So we were in there taking pictures. So I'm gonna sprinkle in old pictures and new aircraft. The new color pictures are generally aircraft that still exist. The next iteration was, uh, of course, you got guns, more guns better. Well, they put a 75 millimeter cannon called the B-25G. I think that was, G was just because where they were in the alphabet. It doesn't really stand for gun. But it has the same gun in the nose as our tank back there. It's a 75 millimeter, fairly high velocity, rifle cannon. It was not real popular because you could fire at best four shots a minute. You got an airplane that's doing, uh, they could do 300 miles an hour, going five miles a minute. You don't have a lot of time to hit your target, or rather, to take shots at your target. 
Uh, what became more popular was they put more machine guns on them, which we'll get to here in a minute. But they put the put the gun in, and they generally did away with the bombardier. I'm oh, sorry, bombardier, and maybe even co-pilot. <coughs> and the H models, they went to single pilot because they put the guy in. The navigator was the cannoneer. He loaded the thing. So he was busy. This one is Barbie three. It's a B25H. It's also current flying around the country. You can see. I'm sure they don't fire the guns, but you can see how they had to stack everything in the mills. And the line of machine guns was kind of going in the right direction. As they went along, they got rid of the cannon and put in more machine guns. Now this is how they made the cannon work. B-25 has a tunnel. Goes from the entryway up behind the pilot seat. You crawl through it, like I said, young people. The bombardier would crawl through out to the blaze last nose to where he did his job as a bombardier. Well, they didn't have him anymore, so they hung this cannon in that companion. And it wasn't real popular because it picked like a mule, very hard on the airframe. And like I say, you only had four shots a minute. If you're shooting at anything, you might get two to three shots off before you flew past it. And if you miss, well, you waste your time. The next line was the B, or B25H, where they combined some H's had guns, some didn't. And they improved the systems, you know, as things went along. You'll notice there are guns in what they call the cheap position alongside the fuselage. They're gunning the thing with machine guns and not the cannon. And they kind of mix up the H models. The J model, this is the one that's coming here, Champagne Bro. That was the basically the end of the line, top of the line. They made more of them because they combined some of the H and G. They didn't have guns, there were big guns in them, but it was the better the airplane. Or they made more of these. And of course, there's more of these left. Uh, there are approximately 100 B-25s that still exist around the country. And, but they are getting scarcer. We have this one coming in, I don't know how many are in the States. Like I said, there were 17 at wright Pattis Air Force Base in 2010. Many of those are still flying. Now, this was the gun location. This is what they settled on, the J model, to get away with the cannon. You got the bombardier has a gun on the nose, you got the cheap guns. Now you got the front, the top turret was moved and from the back of the airplane to the front, so you can turn it around, put more machine guns on target. It also incorporated waste guns. The G model, I'm oh sorry, the H model had them also. The problem with the H and J is the waste gunners have a very good opportunity to shoot off the tail pin or an engine to sell. They have kind of a narrow little field of fire they can shoot in. Still better than that dental turret. And they put in a tail gun, little balls there at the back where the tail gunner sat. Of course, the top turret gunner would move to the front where he could be a turret gunner or he could simply pick some forward and add to the garage. Now the Navy also operated B-25s. Of course, the Navy's got a different name for everything. They call them PBJ. That is not a sandwich order. That stands for Patrol Bomber. J stands for North American Aviation. Now this one would be similar to the Army Air Force H model. But the Navy couldn't call it a B-25 because that's what the Air Force calls it. They call it a PBJ. They didn't modify it hardly at all. They did, later in the war, they had a notion, and when they first started talking about the Doolittle range, they had a notion, well, we could recover those aircraft back to the carrier. And the carrier, Admiral Halsey, said, oh, we're not waiting around, we're out of there. But later in the war, they did. They modified a Cleveland H model with an arrestor hook. And, of course, they took off just by rolling down the deck like Doolittle's people did, but they landed into the wires, and it worked. It was quite successful. The only problem was, you see the B-25 stacked on the deck earlier. Once you've got your B-25 support, what do you do with them? They won't go below that. You got it. Yeah, they go only fair about 16. 
So, okay, yeah, that's a good idea. Now, since they did that, the U.S. Navy now can land and has landed C-130s onto the divots and the uh, larger class carriers. C-130 doesn't need a rest of gear. It's got reversing props, good brakes, etc. The theory is that if you're resupplying a carrier, the small aircraft would be at it all day. A couple C-130s, you can get it done in an hour. It, it is an impressive. If you find a video of a C-130 operating off the carrier, it's, it's impressive. I'm going to introduce you to a guy named Lieutenant Colonel Paul Van Pappy Gunn. He was one of the inventors, if you will, of the machine gun laden B-25. He first did it on A-20s, which is another attack airplane, and on B-25s. Gerald Kenny of the 5th Air Force came across him in uh, Australia. He was evacuated. Pappy was evacuated from the Philippines because he was flying for the Army at that time. They evacuated him to Australia. His family stayed behind. They spent the war under Japanese occupation. He had been in the Navy in World War I. He was a mechanic. He learned to fly after World War I. In uh, 1924, he re-enlisted in the Navy, became a pilot. He did a 21-year stint in the U.S. Navy, retired in the Philippines, and established the Philippines Airlines cargo outfit. It was during the invasion, the Japanese coming into the Philippines, he was instrumental in getting a lot of people out. He knew where all the little airstrips were. And because of that, the U.S. Army commissioned him as a lieutenant colonel. So he went from the Navy back in as a lieutenant colonel, and he had quite a list of decorations. And then instead of me killing all the time here, the book is called Indestructible written by John R. Bruning. And it's very good, very detailed about what it was like getting out of the Philippines, B coming back from Australia to get back into the Philippines, and the way they developed the B-25 and the A-20s to do that. They were very effective anti-ship aircraft. And he got the job of converting B-25s and A-20s into gunships. And this is kind of where the A-10 Warthog idea came from. This airplane is marked it was a B-25C that was converted in Australia. You see there's four machine guns, little white things on the muzzles, sticking out front, and it's got the two cheap guns. And that was how the factory got the idea of putting these cheap guns on production aircraft. This thing has eight machine guns. If the turret was further forward, it would have ten machine guns point forward, which is formidable. Now this is a current airplane. It's a PBJ-1D. That means it's a D model B-25 that the Navy used. And they upgunned this thing almost as far as they could. Uh, in the D model, the turret would have been put back on the tail, toward the tail. It would not have been useful facing forward for straightening. But when you read condition aircraft like this, turrets can be hard to find. So this one was the B, and it was modified with the eight machine guns and the nose. And the factories started doing that as an option here stateside. And you get out onto the Philippines or the islands, they're going to do this. You're going to have, in this case, they got 12 guns. If they reconfigured an H, they have a top turret pointing forward, they have 14 guns. And if you do the math, 14 guns firing forward in the military aircraft M2 machine gun, they're about 800 rounds a minute. If you're firing all 14 of them, you're shooting about 11,500 bullets a minute, which is 210 a second. That's going to tear up whatever it is. There was a battle. Uh, out of Bismarck Sea, Japanese had a convoy resupplying New Guinea with reinforcements. And they had eight transports and eight destroyers escorting them. And this was one of the first uh, episodes where the 25 B-25s that Pappy converted 
was used against the convoy. And in the course of three days, they sank all eight transports and five of the destroyers. There were about 9,600 Japanese troops got on. Here's a thing. 9,600 Japanese troops got on the transports, and about 1,200 washed ashore on New Guinea. And they were refugees, not soldiers. They didn't help anybody. So it basically, the B-25 and the A-20s won that battle because you get a good strafing run on a ship with that many machine guns, it's a halt. It may not sink just yet but it's not useful. And uh, they also had a thing called skip bombing developed in the Pacific. Instead of trying to hit, air, or hit ships from high altitude, they would be down low to the water, less than 200 feet, cruise speed or higher. And they have fixed the distance, I think it's about 1,000 feet or so, you would drop your bomb, and the bomb would skip. If it had a hemispherical nose on it, it would skip a little better than a pointed nose. Well, it would skip like a rock. And it would go about 15, 20 feet in the air, come back down, skip again. Then how many skips you got, depending on the waves and other things. But essentially, if you aimed it right, that bomb is going to go into the side of that ship. The problem with that plan is the bomb don't slow down all that much. If you're heading for the ship, well, the bomb is kind of following you. If it blows up and it hits the ship, it, you might catch a little of that. So they put a delay fuse in it. So when it hit the ship, you had about five seconds or so to get away. Now, uh, you have another aircraft behind you, he'd wait until your bomb went off before he came in there because he could get a face full bomb if he did. They also had a thing called masthead bombing and they would combine both of these. They would drop two or three bombs to skip and as they came over the ship, as they were about masthead height, climbing up off the water, they would drop a bomb and it would hit the ship rather than hit the ocean and hit the ocean skip. So using those two techniques, they could use the machine guns, basically nullify the crew and the deck equipment. Next airplane or the airplane comes back around and skip bombs and scratch one ship. This is a PBJ-1J, which is a J model. It's got radar. They sent a control bomber, so they put radar on. They use these for short control, coast control, etc. And this one, it's a PBJ, 1D, Betty's Dream. I don't know what Betty Dream about, but I'd worry about Betty. But she's got the eight guns in the nose, does not have cheat guns. Now, being a D, probably left the factory without cheat guns. They've got a turret up forward. So somebody took a little artistic license. A D would not have a turret up there. This one does, because probably during the rebuilding process, somebody said, hey, let's put the turret up front. You got a turret? So they did. So they got 10 guns facing forward. And of course, they had to get carried away. This is called the, the North American 98X Super Scraper. What they did was they took the R2800 engines, which is what we have on the P47 right over there, which has an additional 300 horsepower, and they put it on a B25H. They also lengthened and clipped the wings for a little better control authority a little more maneuverable. The problem was, the B-25 is not an airbag airplane. They lost this one in testing because the test pilots couldn't resist. Well, what will it really do? Well, it'll do pretty good up until it sheds the wings, and that's what happened. And after they had the smoking hole, which used to be a prototype, now we're not doing that anymore. This is the cowling. They basically took the cowling off of the B-26. Because the B-26 uses the R-2800s, and they made it into a B-25. A little more engine than the airframe could use. The pilot got a little too frisky with it. On the D production line, they took 45 B-25s and made them camera ships. You can see the bulges on the nose. They have one or two cameras on the fuselage pointing down. This was used for photo reconnaissance, and it was also used for mapping which was a big deal in World War II because there was a lot of this planet, nobody mapped it. Many of these islands, like New Guinea, big island, nobody mapped it. So they would use these aircraft to get photographs, to get maps, so the combatants could know where they were or where they were going. And this is a trainer. 
TBN 25, practically all B25s that didn't get turned to scrap metal became trainers at one time or another. And this one is a B25H, I believe. And they served, actually, they were using trainers up until 1952. North America got a contract to change B25s into the TBN 25s as a multi engine trainer for the Air Force. And the last B-25 in the inventory was donated to a museum in 1974. And I read in my research there was a third world country somewhere, might have been by Afra, they were operating a B-25 up until 1960. A durable airplane, of course. They only made about no, less than 10,000 of them. The thing was, it did so much so well, you could carry practically anything in it. They did launch torpedoes. Not very often, because it had to be carried externally. And there was even a suggestion in the design of people, well, let's put a flight thrower on this thing. Uh, cooler heads prevailed said, no, you don't want to do that. I'm sure you've heard the old admonition, don't spit into the wind. Everything an airplane does is into the wind. So if you launch something out of the airplane, you're going to fly past it or whatever, a flight thrower is not a good idea. I never saw a picture of it with anything so they either burned it or they didn't try it. <laughs> now the total production, like I said, the J was most of 9,890 were the number made. There were 11, get my numbers out here. There were nine countries operated the B-25 with China, Soviet Union. The RAF, RCAF, the Dutch, Soviets, China, Brazil, the Free French. After the war, there were 24 different air forces operating the B-24. We sold off our surplus to everybody on our side. They all wanted B-25s. The last one that the Air Force used was in 1960, the BB-25. And I said there's more than 100 surviving. And we're going to have one here on the 16th, which is this girl, B25J. Uh, the rest of these slides come off of their website. They're kind of touting their favorite girl. It's a North American B25 manufactured by North American. And Allied Air Forces through it. Every theater through World War II, used by many other nations, seen service across four decades. This particular airplane, built 44, U.S. Air Force, 13 years, to trainer transport, personnel transport, 57, and went to the boneyard of Davis Bottom. It was there until 1959, bought by a private company that bought fires in Canada and the USA, the fire bomber. Continued to be used as an air tanker until the late 80s when it was restored to its wartime specifications, which is where it is now. Okay, I'll deal with it. These are the particulars, if anybody's into bookkeeping or whatever, the wingspan, the empty weight, et cetera. Uh, the empty weight is 19,000 pounds. It can carry 35,000 pounds unless you're flying with do little, then you are about 1,000 pounds over that. Service ceiling 24,200. The range 1,350 miles, that's normal. But they did for do little and put extra tanks on that thing. And they had extra jerry cans of fuel to put in to the tank. And they thought, well, if we get lighter, we'll throw these cans overboard. And the Navy said, no, no, you won't. Because you're not going to leave anything that could lead anybody back to the carrier. Because the fastest speed we can run is 33 knots. We're going to get out of there as fast as we can because the Japanese are going to be bad. They were. Estimates are the Japanese military killed 250,000 people after the Doolittle raid. Anybody having anything to do if you gave a villager a button because they thought it was neat. The Japanese found that button, they killed that person. Because they were very angry. Their emperor could have been killed, etc., etc. Now, it was more than a publicity stunt. <clears throat> it didn't really do much damage to anything in Japan, except it brought about the Battle of Midway. Prior to the new little raid, Japanese figured, we got thousands of miles of empty ocean, we don't care, they can't get here. Well, they did. 
and the high command said, well, shoot, we need Midway Island. It's way out there. We can put ships out there. We can put patrol aircraft out there, and they're not going to surprise us again. Well, they fought the Battle of Midway, and that's when they really lost the war. The next slide is the get to sorry is the uh, champagne girl, which is the end of my presentation. If you guys have any questions, you can do that. I strongly suggest you come July 16th. If you don't want to tour the airplane, you don't want to ride the airplane, and you might not be able to ride the airplane anymore. It may be sold out, but it's a piece of history. And it's a working piece of history, which most of the stuff in here is. Uh, maybe we should buy that thing. Anyway, uh, that's all I have to say on the subject. If there's any questions, feel free to shout them out. There's a microphone right there. I'll answer them. I'll make it a good line. This is one of the most important parts of the uh, conference. This is the share part. So we want stories from each one of you. And before we get to the share part, we're going to have stories and, and uh, Michael will probably be able to field most of them. We have other pilots in the room that can field them. On the front of your desk there, there's a sheet. Nobody's filled any out, but if you wouldn't mind working this sheet down the aisle, and this will say you want to come next month. Next month, a uh, guy named Bruce Green, he's a volunteer, a teacher, and been volunteering here all the time. He's going to talk about uh, a little bit about Auschwitz and what he's going to talk about is he traveled with Eva Alex about the Holocaust and um, talked to Mickey Core a bunch so it'll be very interesting on the Holocaust uh, that he's got a big talk on and that will be a month from today so love to have you if you sign up it's what uh, Jack Putnam was saying we'd like you to sign up so we have enough lunches we were short we had 146 people here we had 120 people sign up so if you try to sign up, call my wife or text her. It's on the email. Uh, she loves all those texts. But if you sign this, then you don't have to call her. So now, we're, uh, Forrest is our executive director. He's going to walk this microphone down this way. And uh, why don't you put your hand up for questions and sharing. Good question. Yeah. Please state your name and ask a question. What was the bomb load on the Duke Little Raid? Repeat the question. The bomb load of the Duke Little Raid, they had two 500 pound high explosive bombs and a thousand pounds of smaller incendiaries. Those 2,000 pounds total, which is a small load, the incendiaries were because Japan was mostly wood. Jim Hicks. I'd like to just pass along about my friend Bob Haas who flew me 25 off the Isle of Aishima. And they would fly on, on the water to keep the zebra from diving on them. Take get to the island of Japan, go up to bombing range, find their target, and drop the bomb. He went under a high tension wire, which, I, which fortunately was not copper, but it was aluminum. It went all the way to the part of the spars. On the rear of the, uh, the, rear of the uh, aircraft, he took 25 feet of aluminum wire back to IE Shima. <laughs> we got a question right here. Okay, we'll re over here, Mike, and ask. Uh, okay, Susan Hansen here has a question. She's the. Uh, uh, one of the DAR representatives. That's the Daughters of the American Revolution. Okay, close to the mouth with the microphone. Yeah, it's not really a question. I'd just like to salute the memory of my friend, Olive Francis. He flew with Doolittle in Italy, and I think he was a navigator, and I knew none of this. Of course, none of the World War II men. He went to my church, Luella over there, knew him, and he won a, a silver star in World War II, and I have no idea why. So, if you have memories, please share them with your family so they can be recorded. Thank you. We have a question over here. 
Um, my name's Rhonda, and I was wondering what the PBJ stood for, because we couldn't hear back there. PBJ stands for Patrol Bomber. J stands for it was made by North America. Uh, you look at F4, uh, like F4-6, or F4-F, was an F4 made by Grumman. And there was F4-M, which was made by General Motors. But the Navy would use an acronym as to what the aircraft did, and then the last letter was where it was made. We have a question here. State your name. Stand up, please. You're on camera. Okay. You're on candid camera. My name is Marsha. I'm wondering how old Jimmy Doolittle was when he was I think he was in his 40s. Yes. Yeah, he was uh, a lieutenant colonel. He ended up being a general. I believe he was in his 40s. No, he was not. Uh, he was too young. Now, he was a uh, very active race pilot during the 30s. Uh, he was a member who he raced for, but he flew several air races. Yeah, yeah, he was the first one to do a blind flight. He would, he took off, he was in a biplane. And he had the rear cockpit completely covered because he had a pilot in the front. I believe he took off, I remember the airport now, he used radio signals. He didn't look out of at all. The cockpit he was in was covered over with a hood. And he took off, he flew a course, already, you know, he pre planned it, and he came back and he landed again without looking out of the airplane at all, totally blind, using all of the instruments. And in 1930, Three or four of them, that was. That's gutsy. <laughs> it's called IFR, instrument uh, flying instead of VFR. That's what a lot of pilots use today. That's how you get through the clouds. But he did it, and it was his first one to ever do it, right? right. Yeah. Uh, the purpose of it was the airmail was trying to become more dependable and also safer. A lot of airmail pilots bought the farm, so to speak trying to fly in weather that they should not, and they did not have weather reporting. You're in Dayton, you go out to Cincinnati, you can check the radio station, they would give you the weather report in Dayton, but you're going to go past Hamilton, where the ground falls on the ground, and you can't fly by instruments, and the early aircraft didn't have that capability. They just used highway. If they, they used could, river highway, man. If they could see it. If they could see it, if the ball was on the ground, you're going to get a gray ball. Oh, yeah. Uh, considering the cramped quarters of these planes, were there physical uh, requirements or limitations on the men who could? Get that job? Yeah, but what was their average age and uh, what was the mortality rate? The average age of an airman could be anywhere when he's off duty, could be anywhere between like 19 and 25. Uh, 25, 26, or World War II, you were an old man. Uh, if you were in combat, in, um, in service for two or three years, you started out as a lieutenant, and due to attrition, promotion, and everything else, by the time you were 25, if you were 30, you were probably a full colonel or a general because the attrition was pretty high and they had the, the units that they keep building, they need ranking officers for the size of the unit. So you got promoted pretty quick. Uh, most of the airmen, the military, the actual people doing the work were 18 to 25. 25 would be an old person, no matter where they were. A 25-year-old infantry man was probably like a Yeti, you'd never see it. Uh, World War II, born in 26 is about the youngest. If you lied on your search, the first thing you get in if your birth date is 1927. So anything before 27, 
you could get in the military in World War II. So if you're born in between 1910 and 1918, you're a real mature soldier in World War II. And as we've said before, the CPs, Mr. Brett holds here, but the CPs average age was 37 because they would come and take a whole construction unit like Sobic or, or not Sobic, but uh, industrial contractors, take the whole unit. And they were old men, but they knew how to make things because they're the ones that after you conquered, you had to construct. And they didn't want these neophytes out there that didn't know how to construct things. So, but otherwise, military average age is 18 to 22. Or three. Uh, about bombs, you talk about uh, cranes made a lot of bombs. And I don't know if they made World War II, but they made 500 pound bombs, a lot of them. Uh, and I don't know if they're in World War II, but they're a big bomb center. Lots of uh, ammunition for different wars. Um, <clears throat> hello, my name is Ron Stoke. I was in the Army from 1954 to 1956 as a topographical surveyor, and I flew on B-25s and once on a B-26 Baltimore Marauder uh, on Matt's flights. And also, I'm glad you mentioned that the Brazilian Air Force had it, because I flew twice down there on a B-25. And we would sit on each side of the old Bombay door in there. And I believe, I'm not 100% sure because that's a long time ago. I think we were limited to three on each side, maybe six. So you were sitting on the edge of the Bombay? Yeah, we were, sitting, we were sitting on each side and we got in that way. And we oh, okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. And yeah, they had figured, depending on what they were doing, uh, some of these trainers they would put additional seats. They wouldn't have any guns on them, they'd take the turrets off. Yeah. They would put additional seats to where you had instructor in the right front seat, student in the left seat, and there'd be at least five or six other seats in the airplane to where the instructor got done beating on the poor devil in the left seat. Well, he got to sit down and the next victim came forward until they ran out of fuel or victims or the guy got hungry and they went home. Yeah, I think one of them things that I wanted to say about it was, it was much appreciated by, I was stationed at Fort Belvoir, Virginia for my survey training, mm -hmm. and the free flights we got to go on leave and everything were much appreciated, because there was a lot of guys that got to go home that way. And we flew a lot from D.C. to uh, Louisville, Kentucky, mm -hmm. and also from Charleston, South Carolina when I was overseas. I'd come back into the country by plane and catch a mice flight from there to Louisville and then home. <laughs> but one of the benefits of the military flight crew, and it's even better now, I had an acquaintance who was in the Air Force back in the uh, 90s, flew KC-135s out of McConnell Air Force Base in Wichita. Uh, KC-135 is a big old lumbering gas station. And they were all not too bad out of shape, but they didn't, they wanted the fighters. And the higher classmates got fighters, the rest of the guys got cargo, and they didn't really like tanker, but a tanker does, it takes off and flies a racetrack pattern. Someplace out there, and everybody comes to get gas and goes, and it's boring as all get out. Now, what they did at McConnell, they had T-38 Talon, which was a two-seat supersonic trainer. The Air Force used them as trainers. They were there for currency. So these guys had to do take off something that stay current and keep what they're doing. So when they want to fly on KC-135, they could fly the T-38. Save us taxpayers some money. Well, what happened was many of their flights would originate at about 10.30 in the morning. They'd show up in operations, check out their aircraft, their equipment, fly to McCarran Air Force Base in Vegas, have a nice leisurely lunch, maybe wander around town a little bit, and they get back into their T-38. 45 minutes later, they're home. And we paid for that. <laughs> and I'm jealous that I didn't get to do that. But it did keep them current, and it was a, it's a perk. Any other questions? Yeah, I'm right, right home. Uh, just to add what Mark said real quick, up at Crane, that was uh, started in 1942 as a Naval Ammunition Depot. They made uh, shells for all battleships up to 16 inch up there. They had big lanes. I've seen them turn them out back uh, in the Vietnam time frame. 
and they had all the powder stored up there in a big bag. Uh, and they were shipped out of there with only four large uh, Navy ammunition depots in the U.S. Uh, Crane was the largest one East Coast, and out at uh, Pendleton is the biggest one on the West Coast. But that's where the large shells were made for the ships to go out. It's uh, manufacturing is fascinating out there to see, and they shut all that down. So it's uh, mostly research and development up there now. But there is still some ammo and uh, firearms and stuff stored up there. Hi, my name is Larry Hen. I'm a volunteer here. Uh, my father joined the Army in, before Pearl Harbor at age 26. He served two years of called Flying the Hump, flying out of India. Uh, when he got out of the Army, he was three up and two down, and sorry for the class. And when he was in India, his nickname, if this is to go along with what Mark said, his nickname was Pops when he, at 27. So. I just wanted to add something to that. Thanks. Okay. That is it. We will turn it back to Mike. Well, that's pretty much my presentation. Uh, any other questions on B25? We can go through that. There's something you were wondering about it. Uh, something you read, didn't understand. Feel free. If I don't know, I'll tell you where to look it up. Okay. Thank you all for coming in today. Thank you very much. We only worked two or three months on this project. Uh, I thank you for doing that. He helps with our simulators. We have seven simulators here for uh, kids to learn, adults to learn. We have uh, Dick Yeager in the front row. We've got a guy named Keith that helps with those. We got a tank back here. We're going to try to drive it once a month if we can get uh, proof on all that and get you on a ride in a tank. So we'd like to start that in the near future. Uh, we'll have to tell you next time. All these lectures are put on YouTube. If you have a friend that wants to learn something about B25, we put them on YouTube. We have them on YouTube probably about two or three days. So if you want to find out what we said the last year, it's all up there. Thank you for coming. Come on back next year or next month. Thank you. Get it before everybody tears it up here. Yeah. Very good. Yeah, wasn't he good? Oh my god, he covered all that stuff, didn't he? Oh my god, what a good cover. He covered all that, didn't he? Yeah. Oh my god. Good job, of course. Good job. Well, oh, I've been